Hello, Namaste, and welcome to Delhi. I'm Devina, and this is Work Life India on the BBC, the show that looks at all things to do with money, the work we do, and the lives we lead. Now, one billion people live with some form of disability in our world. Up to 190 million of them have very significant difficulties in functioning. India has 26 million people living with disabilities and be it access to public spaces, education or jobs, life for them is a constant struggle. So we are asking, how can we ensure dignity and inclusion for people with disabilities? Now, people with disabilities are more likely to be unemployed than the non-disabled people. They lag behind on all parameters of social inclusion and face barriers in accessing services like healthcare, education and transport. So how can we empower them? To talk all about it, we have in the studio Devika Malik. She is an international para-athlete. She has overcome hemiplegia which causes paralysis to one side of the body to achieve international recognition. Welcome, Devika. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. And Devika, you were just one and a half years old uh, when you met with an accident that changed your life. That's right. So first, my parents had to struggle with my prematurity. And then I met with this accident, which uh, left me with hemiplegia on the left side of my body. But with uh, constant occupational therapy and sports, which proved to be a great source of rehabilitation, um, I have been able to cope with my disability. And this is what we do now with our foundation, Wheeling Happiness, bring sports as a source of social integration to people with disabilities. And it's a great work that you're doing. So Devika, we want to know all about it. But let me also introduce our next panelist, Swati Rustagi. She's here from Amazon India. She's the Director of Human Resources and works to train and hire people with disabilities. And Swati, it's 650 people that you've hired with disability in the last three years. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, I think more than the number, what uh, what really warms my heart is the ability to include all of these 650. So I think they're just a part of who we are. They're not different anymore. Absolutely. They're with special abilities. Yeah. And that's the kind of mindset change that many corporates are trying to do, but much more needs to be done. And for that, we have Dr. Jitendra Agarwal. He's founder of an organization called Sarthak. And um, he would didn't let the partial blindness get in your way of a greater vision, uh, Jitendra. But take us 15 years back. You were a practicing dentist and you started losing your vision. What were your first fears? So thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, yeah, you are right. Uh, 2004, I lost my vision because of macular degeneration. And if you are macular, the degeneration causes that complete loss of central vision. You are not able to read and write. So you have become non-practicing. And 2004 to 7, you can say drooping in the darkness, you don't know what to do. Initially, I, I tried my rehabilitation and initial fear was that how I can myself rehabilitate or get livelihood for myself. Uh, some of my friend told that uh, uh, people with blindness can work on computers. I learned that art and then medical transcription. And one day I thought, what happens to people with disability in India? I, I researched across India and found that uh, especially in private sector, corporate sector, not a single corporate was ready to hire. And their fear, fear was how to hire and where to hire. And then the idea came to start Sarthak, which can empower each person with disability. And we started in 2008 Sarthak. And you're trying to bridge the gap of skilling the disabled people and also trying to get them recruited in corporates. But uh, Devika, I want to ask you, but what was it like growing up? Because once you're an adult, you do have this fighting spirit in you. But when you're growing up, it's a tender age. You, and you actually studied in a school with non-disabled people. So yes. how did you overcome yes. your fears? So um, I think, as you rightly said, the formative years are the most important if you have a disability at that age to make sure that you are socially integrated and you know you don't grow up to be an introvert because there is a certain amount of bullying that I went through and that happens because uh, every all your other peers are non-disabled so they're not used to seeing somebody like that in their midst and uh, 
it was i think up to my parents to instill that in me to say uh, no you don't have to feel bad you have to go back and educate them and let them know that this is this is a disability that you have it is beyond your control so even as a 6 year old i distinctly remember going back to my classroom with that knowledge and explaining to children there that okay this is a problem but uh, beyond this you know there are certain things i can't do but beyond this i'm fine and then just taking that spirit of laughing with them rather than Was being laughed at. Was it the nickname at. Daffy yes. that you started uh, getting your confidence back with? Yes. So in fact, that happened all the way in college. The first interaction I had was because of my limp. They said, oh, you walk like a duck. So Daffy, that started off. And then at that age, people are more sensitive. So when I turned around and told them this is a disability, they were actually embarrassed that, oh my God, what, what have we said? But I took that as a joke I embraced that term and instead of it being a negative term then it became a term of endearment and now like all my friends call me Daffy so I think that's what it is uh, if we are empowered then we take away that negative power mm. of or the negative connotations of the words that are associated with us mm. but that empowerment is something that begins um uh, with family and then goes up to school education workplace jitendra talking about family you actually had a 3 year old son yeah. at that time yeah. Yeah. and uh, uh, at the same time be in a spot where you're losing your vision how did you explain that to him so it it was very challenging because everything came out came to my wife because i was not able to see i was not able to practice and uh, my son was you can say growing up 3 years uh, so challenge for the family uh, of course so to to overcome those challenges i tried different ways like i used to go to all india institute of medical sciences science for to have medical lectures having some has, having some business for for medical goods i think but was that that was not satisfying me means uh, that was not up to my expectations and so initially uh, after learning this technology when i took uh, technology as a solution for me i think that empowered mm -hmm. me and and the idea of starting sarthak came and okay okay well swati these are two success stories out of millions of them and they are inspiring in their own way of how they've defeated the odds but uh, out of 26 million people living with disabilities in india the employment statistics is still very low just 36% why is it so low so i think some of the challenges that we faced when we um, uh, initiated the program saying we will be more inclusive is uh, the lack of skilling uh, so that the jobs require a certain kind of skill and i think the traditional sectors uh, train people in a certain way and to find people with disabilities trained for those jobs has been one challenge the second challenge unfortunately and i was very impressed to hear your story the challenge has been protective parenthood yes. right and it's natural it's natural to to look after a child more carefully when they have some disability but that becomes often a challenge for us to employ them at workplace so how do we bridge that right. would be very interesting to talk Especially about yes devika you go into the rural areas uh, because we do a lot of awareness campaigns in the rural areas what we find is that if the mindset of the family is such that okay this is a disabled child anyway they will not be able to amount to much so they keep them indoors so that is one thing we are doing we are going into these rural remote areas we are talking to not just the people with disabilities themselves but also their caregivers to say that if you let the world open up to them there are actually a lot of opportunities for people with disabilities and there are people like me um, or other examples of people with disabilities see how successful they are because they were able to follow the right channel of education and skilling now national action plan was initiated by the indian government which talked about uh, skilling almost 2.5 million people with disabilities by 2023 has that taken off has that made any difference uh, jitendra till date i think it has not uh, trained in place more than 1 lakh so still lot of uh, need, lot of work needed to to you can say scale that concept because everything is there uh, i think i was part of that national action plan and it needs to be scaled up in terms of we have to create more training providers all across india we have to create more awareness about that concept to the smaller ngos at the rural level and of course implementation is very important for this
Hmm. But yes, Devika, you have so a point. So, for example, it is important to also understand what we are talking about when we are talking about skilling, because sports is one avenue. And then if we are talking about skilling, uh, at what level, what kind of jobs? Because uh, at the end of the day, to work at an Amazon or to work at in certain positions, mm -hmm. in certain corporates, you would need to have a basis in education. So it can't just be everybody's learning to make candles, you know, because people uh, can do different kinds of jobs as long as they have the basis. So I think the basis starts with education. So education needs to be more inclusive. Uh, and the infrastructure, even if I have a physical disability, I don't need to go to a special school. Yes, Swati, go ahead. Uh, pick up from what uh, you know, Devika said on uh, uh, this whole business of everyone can't make candles. And I, I get that, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think the opportunity is to say, what are the various kinds of jobs available? Exactly. Uh, and I don't think there is, at this point of time, a real way to do this, which is to say, OK, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking from the company that I come for. Uh, is there all kinds of jobs? And yes, it would be very uh, super exciting to have people in the boardroom uh, who would come with special abilities. And that would be great. Um, but when I look at India and I look at the statistics mm -hmm. and I look at how many children have access to brilliant education in the yes, first absolutely. place, I think there's a lot to be said for funding. But Jitendra, I want to come to you for yeah. this, that uh, you actually train people and place them in private jobs. Yeah. But what are the corporates asking you? What are the initial hesitations that they have even for a job which can be done by a non-disabled person? Because these are companies which are investing in their employees, they're looking at the bottom line, and then uh, you are actually competing with that spot of a job with a non-disabled person. So what are the questions that they ask you and how do you convince them? So, so you can say starting from 2008 to 12, not a single corporate was ready to hire. And initially, uh, we started with some BPOs. They proven to the HR, they proved to the corporations. And then we did our roundtable conferences in front of 50, 50 BPOs. And they were convinced, of course, people with disability, but they have, they have, they need some little workplace solutions or initial training program. So in, you can say personal interest of some employee inside the corporate house. And of course, the mandate by top management was very important initially to hire people with disability. And now it's a common practice, like mm. starting from IT, BPO, retail, hospitality, manufacturing, banking, insurance, e-commerce, all sectors are hiring. And I, I think they are hiring uh, with dignity and integrity. What we talk to the corporate houses, it's a business model for them. Mm. They share with mm. us. It's not a charity for them. Because mm. what they have shared, very high retention when they hire people with disability. There is very low attrition. And outcome is better than non-disabled em employees. Well, Swati, as, as somebody who's hired uh, uh, people with disabilities, uh, what's been your experience? Are they more productive than the non-disabled people? So I'm going to talk of two types of benefits that we've seen. Definitely they're more productive. Uh, definitely there's better retention. Uh, definitely there's lower absenteeism. Mm -hmm. I think they're very proud about what they do. But I'm going to talk about the intangible benefits, and mm -hmm. there are just too many of them, right? Mm -hmm. I think they demonstrate the spirit of, um, of achievement. They uh, demonstrate the spirit of doing the impossible. And that creates a huge positive vibe in the, uh, in the larger workspace. And we've actually seen that behaviors improve, interpersonal relationships improve at the workplace when you infuse diverse population inside. But I have a point that we are talking about big companies with deep pockets. Yeah. Uh, in India, uh, most of the people, 80% of the population is actually employed in the informal sector. Yeah. So in the informal sector, you have small businesses as well. Mm -hmm. And how to ensure integration at workplaces. A cafe in Delhi, Echoes, has a special workplace policy that is turning out to be their biggest attraction. I visited the cafe to check it out. 23-year-old Ashish is busy making cold coffee in a small cafe in Delhi. It is another day at work where he attends nearly a hundred customers. Ashish is a waiter here, but he can't hear these sounds. Ashish tells me in a sign language that he has learned and grown here, serving customers with a smile. And working at this cafe makes him happy. The reason is simple innovations done to help the disabled waiters here. There are cue cards and a switch above each table to call the waiter. Well, I decide to try it. So this is a very interesting style of placing an order. Right next to each dish, there's a code written. I feel like having cold coffee, which says, we won. 
So either I can write this code B1 on a piece of paper for the waiter or I can learn the sign language. And before that, what I have to do is press this button. A bulb lights up in the corner and well, he is here. As Ashish gets my order, I meet the owner Pratik. He and his five friends started this venture in 2016. They only employ hearing and speech impaired waiters. We hired the hearing and speech impaired staff because we were in student market and we wanted the students to actually feel uh, what is it to actually being served by a different labeled person. The group has five such cafes and employ 40 disabled workers. The concept has worked to attract the crowd. Okay, it was a kind of like new experience for us since we have been to many cafes and all. So we see casual things, but it was a very creative and innovative and kind of motivating thing for us. There should be more cafes like it with different concepts maybe, with maybe uh, managers, where differently able managers are there, where differently able supervisors are there. For Ashish, these birds are the gestures he needs to smile and continue to work with dignity. Well, that's one concept that is working in Delhi. But Jitendra, I want to ask you that can we have similar uh, concepts for small businesses and can the government help? Because you are uh, actually in conversation with a lot of government officials over what can be done to improve workplace inclusion. So uh, can the government help these businesses? Yeah, government has to work because right now the only incentive government uh, are, is giving to the corporate is PF of that employee for three years. The Provident Fund. Provident Fund. Okay small amount. Uh, what about uh, reservation? Because uh, there's another policy by the Indian government to have a 4% reservation now. It's gone up from 3 to 4% for right. people with disabilities in the government job. Now, if it's extended to a private sector, do you think that could change uh, uh, the scenario right now, Devika? I don't, I don't think you need that in the private sector, really, because the private sector uh, hopefully is more about meritocracy. So, uh, like Swati was saying earlier, if through education, you are creating that funnel because that uh, reservation exists in the educational setup anyway. So if we make sure that people with disabilities, like you were saying earlier, 69% of them that live in the rural areas, they are able to access those uh, facilities and they are, those things are actually implemented. The law is implemented uh, in practice. Then you will not, by the time you reach the level of applying to an Amazon, you will not need that reservation because you will already be at par with your non-disabled peers. Mm. But I think that funneling needs to work better. But could, could the reservation help in changing the mindset, uh, Jitendra? Because if there are businesses who know they have to mandatorily hire uh, people with disabilities, at least it will give some opening and be a start. Yeah. Yeah, I think it can help and it's it's right now happening through the CEO or, or, or the managing director of the company. I think it will surely help uh, in creating op more openings for people with disability and more employment, uh, you can say, across across private sector. So Jitendra, you are actually saying that if the top management is reserving some uh, seats for the people with disability, that could create a positive cycle. Do you agree, Swati? Actually, I don't. I think... Uh... I would rather mandate uh, making that talent available. And okay. from, for that, I would say that if I'm looking for interviewing people for a position, my mandate to my own team in recruitment would be make sure that out of the 10 candidates or the 50 candidates that we're seeing for this position, um, maybe X percentage of them or at least you know, a number of them are from a diverse population. That could be women, it could be people with disabilities, it could be different kinds, it could be transgender, it could be multiple kind of things that we're looking at. And that to me is the starting point of inclusion. Uh, the moment I start uh, mandating the outcome of that interview, then I'm actually actually being disinclusive and are probably also paying a price on meritocracy. But the other challenge also is to reach to the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where I also find a big gap because uh, there have been policies from the Indian government called Sugamya Bharat, which is to make government buildings, to make transportation accessible. In the West, you see there is a lot being done in, in terms of smallest of things, building a ramp uh, on uh, the walkway. But in India, what's the problem uh, that you face, Devika, with a locomotive disability, and what could be the solution then? Accessibility basically means visibility. If infrastructure is accessible, you will be able to see more of us and we look more normal to you. 
so that's definitely a challenge uh, and there's definitely things that are being done about it at least i'm very happy in india in the last few years we are now talking about these things and they are more uh, prevalent in the consciousness of people i don't think 4 5 years ago you would have heard so much about accessible india or you would have heard so much about the purple dollar or you mm -hmm. know what people can do for uh, may, being more inclusive of people with disabilities at least we are having these conversations but definitely a lot more needs to be done in terms of last mile connectivity or even if i'm encouraging someone to come forward and participate in sport uh, when you go to that stadium and you have uh, you are a wheelchair user or you have other locomotor disabilities you need to have an accessible washroom for you to be able to train effectively mm. right mm. so these are little things that people probably don't even think about in their day to day but if my washroom is not accessible i am not able to effectively train for 5 hours at a stretch so everywhere be it your public transport be it your stadiums any public places we really need to have more accessibility and uh, hopefully that this policy will help in furthering that but uh, also the attitude of the managers and uh, swati i want to just take this word from you that what can the managers do who are in a position to make a change what are your tips for managers who are looking at working with people with disabilities how can they change attitudes at workplaces first is to uh, to start with the base that uh, everyone's equal i think it's to start with that mindset in the first place and uh, i think managers often struggle between empathy and sympathy and the moment we are interacting with someone from a from a lens of sympathy uh, i don't think we're doing the best for the individual because it's really not challenging the individual to uh, to demonstrate their full potential at the workplace i think organizations definitely should have internal targets but those are targets that we set for ourselves in order to become more inclusive uh, and it's about enabling our managers with skills uh, to interact with diverse populations and different diverse populations um, enabling empathy very specific to that set of population and it could be simple things like uh, is the workspace comfortable enough and when i say comfortable it's about are you able to do your work in the most effective fashion in the way your chair is placed or in the way you're using technology do you have a washroom uh, do you know how to access the cafeteria uh, and you know the lifts are busy in most large buildings so how are you creating a special ability for people to go down and come up i think there are simple things that we need to do on infra uh it's creating that lens and that eye for watching for those things and solving for the barriers and we call it um how do you remove associate barriers right so if you're removing barriers at workplace i think that's the biggest job that a manager can do to make yes, a person yes jitendra has a point so i think what i have seen in last 11 years that uh, if the organization has put this dna of hiring people with disability in a structured right. way they are succeeding like starting from the recruitment of a disabled employee so how to do the interview of the employee people with blindness people with hearing impairment and people with intellectual disability and the most important part is the appraisal of the employee and fellow employees right. what i have seen people uh, corporate who are above maturity curve they have put a put a star there that if you know the sign language you are a, you can become a manager mm. this mm. is for non disabled employee so if the non disabled employee know the sign language then only he can become a manager so that type of best practices if across the corporate house is pick i think then i think uh, i think it will scale up like anything in india well that's a wonderful idea and i must tell you the cafe that we uh, talked about earlier over there as well the non disabled staff are encouraged to learn sign language to facilitate communication and perhaps that's a new language of uh, inclusiveness as well that's the message they are sending out but thank you all so much uh, for joining us i'm sorry i'm out of time completely but uh, 80% of people with disabilities live in developing countries wherever they are it's high time for their struggle to occupy their rightful place in the society to end for that to happen attitudes need to change and we all have a role to play thank you for being with us to write to us on www.delhi_worklifeindia@bbc.co.uk you can also tweet your comments using hashtag #worklifeindia till next time namaste